Luke chapter 10, in verse 38, we read, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The word of the Lord. Today we continue our series, Impossible Math, but we're doing a special Mother's Day edition. You'll see in a little bit how it all fits together. I've been so excited to do this message in honor of moms, present moms and future moms, natural moms and spiritual moms. So whether you're eight years old or 80 and you're a woman, this message is for you. And if you're a man, don't check out, okay? Don't pull out your Snapchat or Insta or sports feed. Uh, every message we do is a gospel message and the gospel is for you. Besides, we're learning today from Jesus' interaction with women. And every man needs help learning how to interact with women in a selfless way, right? Now, I know this day can be painful for many of us. I lost my mom almost two years ago. I think about her almost every day, some days with more intensity than others. My mom was a force of nature. She grew up in poverty and was divorced when her children were still little. And, uh, and so she had to fend for herself in a culture that oppresses women. And by the way, every culture oppresses women. And yet mom did not allow us to be victims or takers. No, she prepared us to serve to make friends wherever we went, and, uh, and to give beyond our ability. With five children already in the home, we were financially maxed out. But that did not keep mom from adopting my little brother because he needed a home and she had a big heart. It is sweet and painful to think of mom on this day. I know today can also be painful for many women who would love to be mothers and for different reasons have not been able. In our ministry, my wife and I have cared for a number of women who carry this sadness. Um, easy answers are not even band-aids. Only the Savior can heal the heart that aches with unfulfilled longings and he does heal it. The mandate that God gave to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth is reframed by Jesus when he gives the church the mandate to go into all nations and make disciples. There is one family that God is building worldwide and it's the family of Jesus. Each one of our nuclear families belong to his larger family and in his family we are all brothers or sisters, fathers or mothers, spiritual mothers. So on this day, we can help those we love embrace the tension of unfulfilled longings and our deeper identity as members of God's family. We're going to walk through this text and then we'll make some application for us. In verse 38, we read in Luke's gospel, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to pay the ultimate price for our sins. And on that long journey, he still has lots of ministry to engage in, places and people to visit. One of those places is a village where a family he loves lives. It's the home of Martha and her sister Mary and their brother Lazarus. In the Gospel of John, a whole chapter is taken up with this family. We read about this family because of friendship. Friendship. They're not one of the 12 disciples. They're not a Pharisee trying to trick Jesus. No, in John 11, we read Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. This is a family of siblings that Jesus has special affection for and they for 
him. And so on his journey to Jerusalem, he stops by their home and Martha opens her home to him. And here I want to say that the story of Martha and Mary has no villain. Martha is not the bad guy or gal. No, Jesus loves Martha. She's hospitable. She opens her home to him. She's a woman of action. She's generous. You know, she's the kind of woman that if she's throwing a party, you want to be there because it's going to be good. You know, stuff gets done and done well when Martha's around. Don't you love the Marthas in your life? Yeah, Charlie literally does. And even so, there's a contrast here being held out for us nonetheless. Let's read on in verse 39. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Martha's sister Mary is also doing something, but something of a different nature. She's sitting at the Lord's feet. She's low to the ground. She's not moving. She's not running around. She's still. And she's doing something very bold. She's sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. Literally, she's listening to his word. Now, why is that bold? Because in their culture, learning from a rabbi was something that only men did. Domestic affairs and spaces were for women. Learning and higher occupations and public spaces were for men. Now, it's not that Mary's on a crusade. Hashtag women who listen to Jesus. But he and his words are so compelling to her that she can't help but sit at his feet and listen to what he says. Was she irresponsible? Was her personality profile more passive while Martha's was more aggressive? Maybe Mary was more contemplative? Maybe. We don't know. We're not told because it's irrelevant to the story. We're not reading. We're not looking at personality here. We're looking at desire. And everyone has desire. And Mary's desire is to sit at the Lord's feet and listen to what he said. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So while Mary's listening to the Lord, Martha, her sister, is distracted. But it's not just distraction. It could also be translated overburdened. Martha's feeling the pressure. She has guests in her home. She has food to prepare. She has accommodations to make. I mean, she has a full house. And her lovely sister has chosen, of all times, this moment to increase her learning. The gall. You know, when I was little, I loved it when my mom had people over for dinner. You know, because it was a whole evening affair. And we would all bring out our instruments and play them. And there'd be singing. And we would linger. And I loved those times because the food was great. And we got to stay up late. And every chance to stay up late for a kid, it's like sugar shot straight into your bloodstream, right? I mean, it's so exciting. And so I love these times, but I did not like the hours leading up to these events because of the work. It was hours and hours of work. And if I tried to weasel my way out of the housework, it wasn't just my mom's wrath that I had to deal with. My older sisters would pounce on me and give me up. Mom, John's playing soccer. <laughs> Mom, John's in bed and he hasn't done anything. It was cutthroat. Well, that's what Martha's doing. But to the Lord, this is one of those hints that this family is close to Jesus. It's like, come on, Martha, are you, wait, are you using the Lord to get your sister to help you? Are you getting your sister in trouble with the Lord? <laughs> yep, that is what she does. Look at the middle of verse 40. She came, Martha came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now notice that because Martha is overburdened, it's not just Mary that she has a beef with. Jesus also is falling short of her expectations. He's in the wrong. He should care that Mary's doing nothing and Martha is doing everything. Now women, have you ever felt like this? Have you ever felt like, how come no one's helping me? How come I'm the only one lifting the weight of the world? <laughs> Martha, love my wife, love her, 
my biggest fan. I mean, she is my biggest fan. But you know, Martha has put herself in this situation where her happiness, listen to this, her happiness is dependent on her convincing not one, but two people that she's in the right and they're in the wrong. Do you see this? She has to convince Jesus that he should get involved and she has to convince Mary that she should stop doing what her heart most wants. Now, based on your knowledge of how life works, how likely do you think she is to succeed? Not very. Not very. Verse 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things. A few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Isn't that wonderful? We're reminded once again of how much Jesus loves Martha. He says, Martha, Martha. There's tenderness in that address. He's not annoyed by her. You know how Taipei people can grate on us? He's not like, take a chill pill, Martha. I'm trying to change the world here. He's not annoyed. He's not dismissive. He's not self-important. He says, Martha, Martha. There's another place where Jesus does the same kind of thing in Luke's gospel. Remember? When he talks to Simon and he says, Simon, Simon. This is the night, the last supper. And Jesus is warning his disciples that a heavy test of their faith is coming. And so he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, so he knows it will fail. But he says, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Don't you love that? Jesus is pouring his love for his beloved disciple. And so he says, Simon, Simon, it's the same thing here. He says, Martha, Martha. He takes this opportunity when Martha is distraught to help her learn perhaps the most important lesson she would ever learn. And so he says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed. Or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what's better. And it will not be taken away from her. In defending Mary to Martha, Jesus is defending every woman to the world for their right, indeed their imperative, to listen to Jesus and learn from him. I mean, why didn't Martha enlist the help of her brother Lazarus? Where's Lazarus? We don't know. We're not told. Maybe like me, he was playing soccer or taking a nap. We don't know. Maybe he's not there. Or maybe he's with the rest of the men listening to Jesus. Remember, in their culture, domestic affairs and spaces belong to women. Learning, higher occupations, public spaces belong to men. But Jesus is something about Martha and something about Mary that is life-changing, world-changing, culture-changing. And so here's what he says about Martha. And he says it also to Martha. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Martha is worried. Now that word worried for us is a negative one. But in Greek, it's not necessarily so. It could be translated as concern which is a good thing. Martha is concerned about many things. That's a good thing. But the next word, that one is negative. Martha, you're concerned. You're worried about many things and you're upset or agitated. Martha's agitated. She's agitated about the many things that need to get done. And when I think about all the things that moms tend to carry, man, it's a lot, right? I mean, their kids, their kids, school and health, and growth and development, their their cereal of choice, their chocolate milk brand, their favorite blankie that cannot ever disappear because if it does, man, World War III breaks out in the house. I mean, so many things. They they carry their, their home's cleanliness and their family's dinner and medications and vacations. And if you have grown children, there's a host of worries that comes along with that. As they say, a parent's only as happy as their unhappiest child. 
Now, dads, of course, can worry about these things as well, but just not in the same way. And so Jesus says to Martha, Martha, you're worried, you're upset about many things, but few, few things are needed. In fact, only one. And here's where that impossible math comes in. Because Jesus is moving Martha from many to few to one. Did you see that? He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But only few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Do you see the direction? That's the direction that Jesus is taking all of us from many to few to one. Because we tend to think about our lives in terms of Lots of stuff. Our lives are great. We have lots of things going on. We have many plates spinning. Lots of places to be. We love many people knowing us or knowing of us. Many friends, many followers, digital or real. We tend to think in terms of quantity. You know, it's that capitalist impulse in us. Profit and growth. Profit and growth. Profit and growth. And that kind of lifestyle leaves us worried and agitated. But you see, the impossible math that Jesus offers to us takes us in the opposite direction, from many to few to one. But if we have the one thing, we have everything. We could have many things and have nothing. But if we have the one thing, we have everything. Proverbs 17, 1 says, Better a dry crust. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. I was talking to a friend recently, became a Christian in his 30s in our ministry at our last church. Great story of God's work. And, uh, and so Jesus has been reframing everything about his life. He's very successful. He's very ambitious. But he's also learning wisdom. He's learning that more is not necessarily better. And he was telling me how his boss has this very successful practice. But it came at a price. He got divorced. He barely knew his children growing up. And so that lesson that more is not necessarily better is helping my friend make different career choices. He's learning better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting, all kinds of stuff with strife. And so Jesus is saying to Martha, do you want peace and quiet? then fewer things will have to do. In fact, one thing will do. And so that's what Jesus says about Martha and to Martha. Here's what he says about Mary. He says, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Now, listen to me. All of life could be understood as our quest to answer this question. What do I have? What do I have? Now, women have answered this question in various ways. I have beauty. I have youth. I have smarts. I have skills. I have wealth. Men have our own answers to these questions. And based on what we have, that becomes the source of our value. So I am valuable because I have this thing. I am valuable because I have a man who loves me or I have children who love me or I have grandchildren who give me worth or I have a youth on my side or vigor on my side or whatever. I have many friends or many followers online or whatever it may be. My value comes from what I have. But what Jesus is implying here is that all kinds of things are taken away from us except one. That's what he's getting through to Mary, to Martha, to the rest of us. All kinds of things are taken away from us except one. And he says, Mary has chosen what is better. Literally, what the text says is, Mary has chosen the good portion. The good portion. What is the good portion? In the Old Testament, when God is dividing up the land, the inheritance to the different tribes of Israel. There is one tribe that gets no land. Which tribe is that? That's right, the Levites. And why do the Levites get no land? 
Because the Levites were the tribe that God chose to bring close to himself to be in full-time ministry. The Levites were the ones who got to, who got to carry the Ark of the Covenant bear, that bore God's name. They were the ones who got to minister the blessing of God to the people in God's name. And so God says about the Levites in Deuteronomy 10, that is why the Levites have no portion or inheritance among their fellow Israelites. The Lord is their inheritance. Do you see? God is saying, all the tribes get land, but the Levites get me in a special way because they get to be about my work. I am their portion. This is so incredible. Your portion is your inheritance. And you don't want anyone taking your inheritance away, do you? Which is why Jesus says, Mary has chosen the good portion and it will not be taken away from her. What did she choose? What did she choose? She chose the Lord. She chose the Lord. She chose to sit at his feet and listen to his word. And that's my encouragement to you today, women. Make Jesus your strength and your portion forever. Make Jesus your strength and your portion forever. There are some great Psalms that reinforce this for us. Psalm 16 verse 5. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Don't you love that, women? Don't you love that, men? Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Psalm 73, verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Make Jesus your strength and your portion forever. No one can take him away from you. And he will never take anything good away from you. That's amazing. Jesus will never take anything good away from you. Do you know what are the only things that Jesus takes away from you? Your sin and disgrace. There are scriptures to that effect. The only thing that the Lord will take away from us is our sin and our disgrace. And maybe there are women here today who have a very hard time letting go of something you've done. Something you've done in the past. Maybe something you're so deeply ashamed of. And you need to know that Jesus takes away our sin. He takes away our disgrace. He does not want you. He does not want you walking around in shame, in guilt. That's why he died. That's why he died. He died so that you would not walk around in life ashamed, guilty, full of regret. Please, if that's you today, I beg you, talk to us, talk to me, talk to a pastor, talk to one of the women in ministry or just a woman that you know. The Lord wants to heal you. He wants to heal us. He wants to go into that place that marked you so intensely with guilt, so intensely with shame and call you daughter and call you to peace and call, call you to wholeness and joy. That's the only thing he'll take away from you. Your sin and your disgrace, nothing good. Nothing good he will take away. You know, the, the history of humankind, sadly, is so much the story of the cultures of the world taking from women, taking their dignity, taking their worth, taking their opportunity, taking even their lives in favor of boys. Take, for example, how women are told to dress. In more traditional cultures, women are told to hide, to not be seen. In more progressive cultures, women are told to be hot, to look a certain way. But in both cases, their personhood and dignity and agency is taken away. See, Jesus says, women, my sisters, I'm giving you something that no one can take away from you. I'm giving you myself. Make me your portion and no one will have power over you. Make me your strength and your portion forever. 
This is the invitation the Lord gives to all women. Life took so much from my mom. But later in her life, she did come to Christ. She did make him her portion. And he gave her so much peace and so much confidence. And now she is with him forever. And I remember in the months leading up to her death, when she lived with us, in all her faculties, she had an aggressive degenerative illness that was just taking all her faculties, mental and physical, away. And so I would put her to bed at night. And um, she was like a child. It took us forever <laughs> to get her in bed because just every step took so long. But then once she was like finally in bed, you know, I would sit by the, on, you know, by her side. And, and there was a verse that I was giving her. And I would just get the verse going uh, and have her finish it. And, um, and we did this every night. And we did this for months. And she loved it. It was Philippians 1.21. And it says, Para mí, vivir es Cristo y morir es ganancia. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. She knew that verse. She believed that verse. She was ready. She was ready. And that's my prayer for all of us here, as men and women. That would be the meaning of our lives. That for us to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, let me say one more thing. In a culture where only men had access to learning and education, Mary did a radical thing in sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to his word. And Jesus did a radical thing in correcting Martha and affirming what Mary was doing. And so I want to say to all the women here to love the Lord your God with all your mind. With all your mind. Be students. Be students of the word of God. And I don't just mean read the Bible devotionally to warm up your heart and encourage you for the day. There are publishing houses that are happy to just give you that forever. Just book after book after book that devotionally speaks to women, devotionally speaks to women. Listen, there's a place for that, for sure. But there is so much more. We need women, younger women and older women who know the scriptures who know how to trace an argument in a book, be it Romans or Hebrews or another book. Women who understand the history of Israel in the Old Testament or the larger themes in Genesis or in Leviticus. Yes, Leviticus. Women, don't be afraid of Leviticus. Women who understand church history and theology, the doctrines of the faith and apologetics and missions, and on and on we could go. I would guess that the majority of women, grown women in this room, have college degrees. I've also talked to many people who just have a high school degree, and they do thinking at a very high level. Now listen to me. I know some people don't like to do that. I could hear your objection. Are you saying that we all need to become intellectuals? No. I am saying that all of us are called to love the Lord our God with all our mind. Some men and women are happy to engage in less rigorous thinking. And that's okay. That's how God made them. But I've known men and women who do very high level thinking and studying in other parts of their lives. But when it comes to the knowledge of God, they put that on autopilot and that won't do. I've had incredible, some incredible women partners in the gospel some of them went to seminary later in life just so they could serve the church and maybe that'll be some of you some of them did the heavy lifting learning on their own but all of them all of them were Marys sitting at the feet of Jesus learning from him listening to his word and so women your children your grandchildren, your spiritual children will rise and call you blessed. We need your mind. And men, please support, affirm, 
release the women in your lives so they may be able to do this very thing. There are some incredible Christian women who are gifts to the church who are doing the very thing that I'm advocating for here. They're helping us think God's thoughts after him. And so we want to learn from them. And so in the lobby today, we have four books by four women authors for men and women to read. And I would just encourage you, pick up one of those books and learn and be inspired. So here are the books, four of them. One of them is Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion. This is by Rebecca McClellan. So this is on apologetics. And this book tackles the hardest questions that our culture is throwing at the faith today. It's incredibly well done. The next book is The Gospel Comes with a House Key, Practicing Radically Ordinary Hospitality in Our Post-Christian World. This is by Rosaria Butterfield. Both of these women have PhDs. They are incredible thinkers. I encourage you to read these books. This second one is about hospitality. It's about how we're going to help people come to the faith in our post-Christian world. And the answer is not just we invite them to stuff at church. That's part of it. A lot of it is going to happen in your home. A lot of this is going to happen as they get to know you. And you may be like, I don't know how to do that. Pick up that book. The next two books are more geared toward parenting. One of them is Mama Bear Apologetics, Empowering Your Kids to Challenge Cultural Lies by Hillary Morgan Fair. And so this book is just going to help you know how to train your children's minds. We don't want to just teach our children what to think. We want to teach them how to think. We want to teach them to see through the world's lies. Now, I know this, this of all four, this one is the one that's more geared toward women. I mean, in the title, right? Mama Bear. If she had said Papa Bear also, uh, but hey, I have read parts of this book and it really helped me. So anyone can read it. And then the last one, the Jesus Storybook Bible by Sally Lloyd-Jones. For years, my favorite um, children's Bible. Incredible. It has the gospel from first to last all throughout. We have these books in the lobby at half price or highly discounted because we want you to read them. And so women read these books by fellow women and be inspired to love the Lord with all your mind. And men read these books by sisters in Christ and be inspired to love the Lord with all your mind. Let me close with this. Mary learned from Jesus because she loved him. She loved him. She sat low by his feet to listen to him. She knew those feet well. John tells us that just before his death, Mary, this Mary, took a pint of pure nard and poured it on Jesus' feet and then wiped them with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Judas, the betrayer, saw the gesture as a waste, but Jesus saw it as preparation for his burial. Because just in a few hours, days, those same feet would be pierced for her transgressions, for our transgressions. You see, Jesus chose the good portion, the Father, through all of his life. He did not give himself to the many things of life, the things that would increase his power, his acclaim, his riches, his fame. No, he gave himself to the one thing, to the Father, to doing the Father's work. He's the only one who in all of his life said, God, you are my strength and my portion forever. It's the only one who ever did that. And yet he lost his portion. He lost his good portion, his father. Because you see, sin separates us from God. And when Christ was on the cross bearing our sin, he was separated from his father. He lost his father so that you and I would not ever have to lose him. That's how much he loves us. His good portion was taken away. 
so that he could take away our sin and disgrace. That's how much he loves us. And it's because of his sacrifice and only because of his sacrifice that we are able to make the Lord our strength and our portion forever. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We give you thanks for this incredible word in scripture. This is an incredible passage, Lord, that is holding up for us something that's radical, radical in every culture. And it is the call to women by our Lord to be his disciples, to follow him, to learn from him, to love the Lord, their God, with all of their heart and all of their strength and all of their soul and all of their mind. And Father, I pray for a revolution in our generation right here in this church. For women to love listening to the Lord's words, learning from Him. I pray, dear God, that even right now, you would give new passions to some of our women, to many of our women, to all of them, whether they are young or older, it doesn't matter. Lord, we need our sisters in Christ. And I pray that you would help us all to affirm them, to support them, to release them, to learn from them. Thank you, God, for being so good to us. Thank you for loving us as you do. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for going to the cross, Jesus, losing the good portion, the Father whom you always had for all eternity. Yet you lost him, that we may never lose him, that we could make the Lord our God our portion forever, that our sin could be taken away, our disgrace could be taken away, our guilt taken away, the wrath of God justly falling on us taken away because you, Jesus, absorbed it all for us. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.